All right, welcome everyone, CS235, this is lecture 18. Uh, today it's going to be, uh, I have entitled the lecture, The Scraps, because there are a lot of very interesting topics that for sort of just an introduction, they're not particularly long, they're five, ten minutes max, um, but they're super cool and they're super important. It's not like a cohesive lecture like today is servo motors or today is linear motion. So. I haven't lost my mind. There's a reason why we're only t doing five, ten minutes and flitting around. It's because these are the, the non-cohesive things, and I figured it'd be better to stick them all together like a crumb cake donut rather than just sort of launching them at you randomly. Let's do a few administrative items real quick. Rohan. One member of each team, please raise your hand. You can sort of... These are the set screw coupler, flexible shaft couplers for your DC gear motors from Fidgets. Ready? You never throw mechanical components. <laughs> Can you please give one to Robert? Okay, so let's review. You've got a stepper and board, DC motor and board, a f clamp flexible shaft coupler to your stepper, a set screw flexible coupler to your DC gear motor. I've given you all your bearings. The 8020 is now in, it's in the shop. A word to the wise, don't cut it without me or Rob there. You'll ruin it and then we're all screwed or hurt yourself. So you're free to come in and cut it, just make sure we're there to show you how to do it properly. Is there any, uh, I just placed all of the McMaster orders for the people who uh, emailed me them as of two o'clock. So, um, like 99% will be here tomorrow morning or afternoon. Let's try afternoon because sometimes they're late in their delivery. Everything else I had to overnight from Chicago warehouse so it'll be here on Wednesday. Is there anything else you guys, I just sent out the starter code and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, David Cummings was nice enough to CAD the 8020 nut for us and I sent that out too. Are there any resources that you guys are waiting on that I need to make sure to get on top of? I uh, ordered all those. To any, anything you guys sent me from McMaster, and I think what I'm going to do, unless anyone has objections, there's a lot of like, I need three, you know, M3 by eight screws, but they come in packs of 100. So I think what I'd like to do is take everyone's part orders, put it in a giant spreadsheet, and then if someone needs something they don't have, check the spreadsheet, and then let's be nice and neighborly and share with each other. And that'll save us time and money. So I'll write that as a to-do. Are there any dire needs for final project that I need to get on top of? Yes, I'll probably place one a day. Could we, to like be efficient with shipping costs, could we give you something else that we're paying for? Like a linear guide? Um, I can't do that because I don't have a way of accepting your money. So I would like to do that, but I'll get yelled at by the powers that be if I do that because it looks like I'm pocketing your cash, <laughs> which I'm not, but anything else? Okay, so here's how the lecture's going to go. Hodgepodge, and then towards the end I'll start to show you the GUI, just like I'll just show you the bare bones of what it is, and then anyone who wants to stay afterwards to install it and actually see how to go through it, I'll give you a hint. I was coding until 3.30 last night. So do you think there are detailed comments explaining how it works or not? No. Once it ran, I went to bed. So there are no comments. <laughs> so you're all screwed in terms of that. <laughs> so if you want to know how it works, it behooves at least one of your team members, probably the elite hacks or coder, to stick around and find out after class. I'll be here until 8 tonight. Rob will be holding office hours every night this week, 7 till 10 p.m. So feel free to laser cut or do whatever. Might not be a maximum available time. Okay, uh, except for tonight. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he'll be here 7 to 10. As we get closer to uh, the office hours or the final project, I'll be here more and more, a little bit at night. But try to email me if you really need something done. Uh, ba -bum -bum -bum. I 
think that's all of the administrative stuff. Any other questions about final project stuff? Okay. So a couple things that I just noticed people asking about a whole lot. I notice a lot of you don't know the term gusset, even though you've used one. So let's talk about that. Say I have two beams, and I want to form them at a right angle like this, okay? That joint's going to be weak, and they're going to want to flex. So what you do to stop that is you put something called a gusset in between. So let's pretend I have a sheet here, and then a sheet here, okay? And they're going to want to rotate that way. Does this look like lab one? We had some gears here and some gears here. Remember that? triangular plate, that is called a gusset. Gussets are primarily used for uh, resisting moment loads. Why else might I want them? Let's try, let's try something. Um, you all know what cardstock is, right? It's like thick paper. So, say I have two pieces of cardstock and they're very flat. And I would like to make a perfect right angle out of cardstock. How easy or hard do you think that's going to be to align it to 90 degrees just with two pieces of cardstock and some glue? It's going to be impossible. If you have a plate, one day I'm going to be able to draw parallel lines, I swear. If you have a plate, sitting on another plate, this thickness here, assume they're the same thickness. As that goes down, it's harder and harder and harder to get them to sit at 90 degree angles by themselves, okay? Remember I was telling you some, some of you about the linear slide, you want to get super narrow ones, and I said don't do that, and it's not about the load rating, it's about the fact that they're so narrow, you can't get it to sit flat on a piece of wood. So if these were like a foot wide, no problem because we could align it. But as they get razor thin, we can't. We can use a gusset because the gusset is precisely 90 degrees. Maybe we don't even need this for loading. I don't know. Maybe someone invented a razor thin sheet of diamond and it's super strong. Um, so we don't always need this for strength. A lot of the time we have this for 90 degree alignment. And... Um, I'll give you a hint. If these things don't say precision, they're not. Masumi, as always, has these, very precise. If you're trying to debate between getting Masumi to, mach to uh, give you one or getting it machined to go Masumi, there's no way that a standard machine shop can hit the tolerances of these precision gussets for anywhere near the cost. So that's a gusset. Okay, and then I forgot something. Yeah. Can we do more than, or less than 90? Uh, sure. Yeah, maybe we want to do something obtuse, or, but um, typically you don't see them like that. So if you want to do this, you'd have to get it machined. But yeah, anytime you have two plates set at an angle, you need some t something in between both to set the angle and to resist the bending loads. Yep. Can you just laser cut them? Uh, you can just laser cut them, yes. And that's what we did for lab one, and that's what I recommend you doing for the final project. So let's talk about something real quick. Um, our robot arm is essentially a giant cantilever beam, right? So you've got a shaft here and then, I don't know, some type of gripper out here. So if I apply a load here, and say this is zero and that's X, where on X are the highest loads experienced? Huh? Right here. Okay. So uh, do all of you know about flexural stiffness and stuff? If I take an axis out of the board, that flexural stiffness is, uh, let's call it KF, that's directly proportional, I think, to the moment of inertia, but this, this is the, the uh, geometric moment of inertia. So if this is the axis and we put all of our material right here to bend about, it's not going to be very stiff. But now if we add things here where there's a lot of area that of material that's way away from the axis, suddenly we're way stiffer. So this is why I-beams exist, where it's a beam on bridges that looks like an I. This is called a U-channel. 
they, they exist because they're trying to put the material as far away from the axis as possible. This is why, say you have a, a shaft, okay? The stiffness of this in flexure is not particularly more than an annulus because the material right around the center literally isn't doing anything for us, it's just making it heavier. So if you guys have a robot arm, a lot of your designs have been basically rectangular extrusions. What could we do to make that stiffer without adding a whole lot of weight? We could do something like this, okay? We could put a triangle on both sides. Now why did I make it a triangle? I could do a U-shape, that's perfectly fine. If you want to be lazy and do just a U-shape, so basically you take your rectangular extrusion and then just put ribbons along the top on both sides, that's fine. Why does it make more sense to do a triangle? The material increases more as you're away from the axis. Exactly. We just said that the loads out here are almost non-existent and then the loads here are the highest. So we're increasing steadily in terms of the loading. So we're increasing steadily in terms of the amount of extra stiffness that we need. So here, uh, if this was a rectangle, this material out here wouldn't really be doing anything so because the loading's so low. So we make a triangle so that uh, we save weight as the loading this way uh, decreases. Yep? How would you fasten that? Would you do it like we did in lab one? Exactly. Just a series of jigsaw puzzle pieces. Do you want to put it in the bottom or on the top? Doesn't matter, I don't think. Maybe it does. Uh, probably the top. Okay. So say we have a wall and let's say this is pinned and we're going to apply a force here. Okay? Now I'm going to put, I don't even know if technically it would be called a gusset, don't worry about it. I'm, this is pinned, okay? It's free to rotate, so it's just going to fall over. So I'm going to put either a member here or a member here, and let's label this T for top and B for bottom. Which do I want to do and why? If you have a cable, then that will definitely be at the top, right? But normally if you have this beam, they put the stuff in the bottom, right? Yeah, so, so what Keith is saying is if we just have a limp noodle piece of steel cable, we could only put it in the top because you can't push on a noodle. Okay, but say I have the latest and greatest 80-20. I have a beam, so a beam can be either top or bottom. So what's the answer now? Why? So you're correct, the top pulls, this is in tension, and the bottom is in compression. The but the, con is the conclusion is incorrect. Typically materials are stronger in tension, like standard issue robotic construction materials are way stronger in tension than in compression. And what else do we have in compression other than just the material strength? We have a geometric loading problem. We have buckling. Mm -hmm. so a lot of the time you'll see these in awnings above restaurants where they'll have an awning come out and then they're supporting it top instead of bottom. Because here they can use cables or it, just whatever they do, it's in tension which is stronger and they don't have the buckling problem. So in terms of your robots, if, if you have the choice of putting them on bottom or top, um, in this case it, it, it's a different situation, it doesn't really matter, so don't worry about it. But I wanted you to understand in a more general case, you want to look at is your material in tension or compression. Tension is better and you don't have buckling. Uh huh. <coughs> Box, uh, um, bookshelves are usually in the Yeah, I don't know why they do that. That's weird. I wouldn't do it that way. I think the problem is screwing it in, right? So, the, so the, if, it's, if you have this teeth, right, I mean, it's going to fall on the top. Right? If you put it on the top, it's going like, uh. to. Right? Oh, I feel like, yeah. That would be, uh, yeah, so what Keith is saying, uh, so Jonas and Keith, they're saying, why do bookshelves always put it on the bottom? And Isn't Keith... Isn't it just because the top has to be flat? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you're asking me why they designed Ikea things the way they did. And my answer is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it may have something to do with, with compressing or pulling on the, um, the screws, I'm not sure. Okay, any other questions about gussets, yeah? Uh, related to this topic, might be some people is if you can comment on how to build the first joint to also withstand. Ah, yes. First joint. So the shoulder joint. Um, so 
The main killer of mechanical systems is moments. And the way moments kill bearings is if we apply a moment, then we end up having to resist it with a radial force on the bearings. Everyone see that? And radial forces on the bearings eventually will dent the bearings. So for a given torque, what can we do given the same pair of 8 millimeter bearings to um, resist that better? Increase the distance. There's no reason to put your bearings right next to each other. There just isn't. Put them far apart. For the lab, for the final project, I am perfectly happy if y'all do things like this. It's totally fine. There's no reason not to. Stack spacers? Like you can stack spacers. I've seen a bunch of different designs in terms of they've got two plates separated with 80-20. They've got boxes, laser cut boxes, separating them. But the point is, if you put your bearings, if you literally took lab three, and made that the first joint, it's not going to work because it's like three times as long as lab three and there are loads on it. It's going to kill the bearings and also this is laser cut wood, right? So it's just going to smoosh the bearing against the hole and then you're going to be wobbling. So separate your bearing literally at least six inches, okay? If you do that, would you use two bearings or four bearings? <laughs> um, Why would it might be okay to use four? Okay. <clears throat> Do you mean four just for a single joint or for two joints? For the single joint but where you have two uh, prongs that come out attached to the shaft and they would make a seat. Oh. We have the top of the box and the bottom of the box both extending out onto the shaft. I'm not sure I'm going to agree on that one. Uh, I guess we're referring to the compliance of the seat. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that individually with people. Okay. Basically, as I look at your CAD, some of you have noticed I've been slashing it with a marker. Um, so we'll do that individually. But I will discuss, here's a quick question. Uh, lab three, okay? Say I've got two of them together. So sort of a scissor type thing. So say I've got this, and then on the bottom, I've got a slightly bigger one, and it's on the same shaft. How many bearings should I have? Don't all hurry to answer it. Let's have a show of hands. How many people think it's two? How many people think it's four? The majority of people win. It's four. I've seen some designs that basically do this. They'll, they'll put one bearing and a second bearing. Ooh, that's a triangle. A second bearing. It's like this weird hook thing. Um, and then they'll put a spacer in between on the inner race. And then they'll load it. Is this preloading a bearing if you put a spacer in between the two bearings? No. A spacer that touches the two bearings makes one giant bearing. Okay? Let me, let me draw this for you. This is totally off, off field, but it's important and I've, people are being stubborn about it. Because the spacer will rotate. Yep. Well, that, that's actually not the full picture. Okay, right, here's the ball, and then I'm going to put a spacer right here, okay? And then I'm going to put a little shim, and then I'll put a little velvet washer, and then I'll put a clamp here and a clamp uh, here, okay? So in terms of the way, let's look at it, let's say the outer races are grounded. We attach them to a block and we ground the block, okay? Remember what what in its essence is preloading doing to the balls? It's displacing them. Remember if we have a ball here and a ball here, what preloading is doing is it's pushing the balls down against the extremes of their races so they can't move anymore. You can't have preloading without deflection. Okay? Between the bearings. So if you fix this distance L between the outer races to, to uh, which is what we always do to preload we have to then be able to deform the inner race to L minus delta if I can't subtract the delta it's not preloaded so what putting a spacer here does is what it fixes L it defeats the purpose so please don't use two bearings and try to separate them to be cheap. It doesn't work. If you have 
one joint, you have two bearings. The fact that they share a shaft doesn't mean anything about the bearings. You still have two bearings per joint, always, no exceptions. If you wish to preload it, it has to be two bearings. Putting spacing in between doesn't work. That cleared everyone? Okay. Boss blinds. I forgot to tell you about these uh, the other day during our, t our discussion of linear motion. Somebody tell me what a spline is. Hmm? Don't be shy. The worst thing that will happen is I'll release the hounds. Yeah. So remember, a normal spline is like on your servo where you have some type of entrapping geometry and then you have a nut and it, we slide in and out of the board. Okay? And then remember a... Um, a, a, a linear ball bushing slash bearing is basically not this, it's just circular and they're reciprocating balls all around to lower the friction so it's rolling instead of sliding. So we can combine these two into what's called a ball spline. And what that typically looks like you take a ball bearing and then you add a little uh, protrusion that runs along the length of the shaft okay and then that keeps it from rotating so it has the smoothness and and the it has the preloaded low friction rolling contacts of the linear ball bearing slash bushing but the linear ball bushing can rotate about at the axis whereas this can't because it has this entrapping geometry everyone see that What's the you tell me what the point is. It can't rotate. I don't it, understand why would you ever have it a bearing. Can it move this direction? It can move this direction. It's the okay. It's a spline. See how it's a spline? It has one tooth that keeps it from rotating. But a spline is sliding motion, and that sliding motion requires a gap that gives us wiggle, and also it's high friction because it's sliding. The balls from the linear bushing slash bearing mean it's, it's pre-loaded rolling contact so there's much less wiggle than in the regular spline and much lower friction. It's kind of a hybrid of the spline and the linear ball bearing size pushing called a ball spline. Any questions about that? They're pretty rare. I don't see them that used that much. How is this different from the reciprocating linear ball bearing that I recommended all you guys buy? It's not. Functionally. The thing where it's just a rail and then a head and there's ball bearings inside because this and if we look at it this way it's, it's called a linear guide ball bearing this doesn't rotate and it's preloaded ball bearings so it's low friction it's the exact same thing um, I'll give you a hint this is really hard to mount so if you need preloaded ball bearings low friction motion that resists rotation just get this, but I wanted you all to know what it is so you don't feel like I cheated you and withheld critical information. Okay. Now there's another way. Remember, when we discussed linear motion, I broke it down into... Um, who has a laptop open with email right now? Can you please email me to make a spreadsheet of all the parts? Because I just erased my note to myself. Sorry about that. Um, I broke linear motion into two main topics. Do you remember what they were? How to blank and how to blank. Constrain, Constrain and, and power. Constrain and power. For linear motion, or well, also rotary, but it's particularly confusing for linear motion, we have to break it into how do we constrain linear motion and how to power it. Has anyone heard of a cam follower? Show of hands. Okay, about half of you. So a cam, imagine we have a linear slide, okay? And we're going to fix that so this slide can go up and down, okay? Now, say we want a, a, some type of up and down motion, just cyclic. We want it to go up and down and up and down forever. So what we could do is do any of our power transmissions. Maybe we'll have a screw or a friction drive or a cable or belt or something and then we'll plug in our DC motor and we'll control the trajectory so our little motor, say we put a motor 
right here, okay? And then we're going to have to feed it some type of sinusoidal motion. This is zero. So up here is clockwise and down here is counterclockwise, right? So we have to take a DC motor or servo and we have to carefully control its trajectory to go back and forth so that we can get this up and down motion. There is a purely mechanical solution to this that doesn't involve any electronics, which is So we put this on a bearing and say this is a really heavy slide and gravity is this direction. This is going to go down. Let me. So when we rotate to the flat section, this will go down and then we rotate to the, um, the, tall, the tall section, this will go up. Right? This is called a cam or a cam follower and they're everywhere. Can someone tell me what the most common places you see a cam follower? Engines. What do they do in engines? They move the pistons. They move the pi uh, No, that's, that's not true. They open the valves. They open the valves. So let's take a look at that. First, let me show you a cam follower. Okay, so see, this follows, it goes up and down. Now somebody tell me some, a couple obvious things about this. There's no gravity, we're in space. Cam followers don't work well in space without something critical. What is it I need? A spring. If gravity isn't strong enough to maintain proper contact, then you tie a spring here, okay? Somebody tell me something else obvious about this. There's a roller on the end. If this is just a flat piece of metal here, this is sliding contact. Remember, we always want to get away from sliding contact and go to rolling contact. So instead, let's put a roller here. Okay? Somebody t uh, let me look at this one to make sure I don't put my foot in my mouth. Okay, let me show you another movie so that my question will actually work. Okay, check this one out. So you see the spring and you see the roller. And the roller, the, why do we have the roller? Okay. Now so tell me one last obvious thing about this and I'll pause it right here. Tell me about the shape of that cam. It could be asymmetrical, um, convex, concave, meh. You can have all types of weird shapes, but keep in mind this is a physical system that has to work. So say I have a cam that is shaped like this for this roller. Will this, will this work? Depends. What does it depend on? Depends on how strong that spring is and how fast you're rotating. You run the risk of losing contact. Um, yeah, well part of it is when you're rotating this way, you're putting some weird side loads and you may jam the mechanism depending on how high those loads are and how high those loads are is related to how stiff that spring is, so you're correct. Let me, um, let's draw a bigger roller. Say I want to put this roller in here. Will that work? Why not? The radius is bigger than any of the radii in here. Now what if I use this roller? Will that work? Independent of the springs and all that? Just from a pure geometric, geometric can it fit in the hole? Yes. So this will work because it fits in here. This will not work because our roller can't even fit in this cam. So if it's smaller, does that mean the impact like it will jam less as well? Because uh, I'm not sure. Let's try this. What if I wanted to give you, and I'm going to make a really tiny roller, okay? And I want to go up and down. Will this work? Why not? Because I can't actually access this inner side. This is, that's physically impossible. So 
This is to say, every time people see cam followers, especially on YouTube, like, oh, this is awesome, I can do any shape in the world. You can't. It depends on the roller size. It depends on if you're not doing something where you can physically access it. And then let's try something else. What about, what about this? Will that work? It'll work. Just keep in mind it's going to be super jerky motion and your ball bearings are going to be going boing, 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 <laughs> boing. So um, sharp edges on cams really uh, have a lot of impulse loading of the ball bearings, especially if you don't have a roller. If you have a roller, this will actually work just fine. Um, but uh, if you were to just have something flat on this, it, you, you'd have a lot of jamming depending on how you get it. Trust me, try it out, laser cut one. Mathematically it works just fine, but it'll, you'll get some weird impact loading. Let me show you one. Okay, what am I going to tell you all? Anyone recognize these? Legos. Legos. And what should you be doing for Christmas? Buying. You should be buying them. <laughs> because Legos make cam followers and that's freaking awesome. Can you see? See? That's awesome. <laughs> Can you with the, like, no, this is just gravity. Now, remember, we're getting some type of a weird sinusoidal reversing direction motion. What's our motor doing in this case? Spinning. Just spinning infinitely in the same direction. Do you need any special electronics to spin a motor infinitely at the same velocity? Nope. You just hook up power and ground and that's it. You're setting a voltage and that's setting a velocity. So back in the olden days of factories, you know, World War II era, cams were everywhere. And maybe they weren't driven by DC motor, maybe they were driven by a steam turbine or something, but you can get all types of very complicated trajectories by just spinning the motor at a constant velocity. Let's look at the, uh, the car. <coughs> and I believe my notes say, Three minutes and 22 seconds. The number of valves that engines have varies. Older engines tend to have one intake and one exhaust valve. Some engines have two intake. And okay, so these are the intake and exhaust valves. Most high performance engines use two intake and two exhaust valves. The opening and closing of the valves is performed by the camshaft. Some engines use one camshaft with rocker arms and or push rods actuating all of the valves. If the camshaft is above the valves, it's called a single overhead camshaft or SOHC engine. When an engine uses a separate camshaft for the intake and exhaust valves mounted above the valves, this design is called double overhead camshafts or DOHC. Okay, so we're, I'm going to spare you the rest of the grease monkey stuff, but um the reason why they're doing this is because if you had to have a motor per uh, valve, that would be really painful. And also you'd have to clock all the motors together. Imagine like if we built an engine like we built robots, where everything that moved required a DC motor and an encoder and a homing sequence and initialization and clocking them together. It would be hell. So this is all purely mechanical. You have one crank that turns the camshaft. The cams are at very precise angles with respect to each other. Everything's timed mechanically. It's very nice. Yep. So the, this is good for making complex linear motion, but if, if that linear motion is like pushing on something or like actually has, needs to have some forces at the end, is it still going to work well? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. what, won't the cam get like high at like weird angles where it has to like create a lot of force but with like I mean, it can. You always have to do the analysis to make sure that, uh, for instance, we w we'd want to check, me check, make sure we're not going near any singularities where it's just going to be impossible. But, uh, you know, you're right. The lever arm is, is changing depending on how we do it, and there may be situations where it wants to jam. So that's just something you have to actually do the analysis on. Does this have to be linear? No. I thought the movie, I, I hoped the movie showed actually. 
Look again. What, what's a rocker arm? Yeah, it's a push pull for rotation. So what they're doing is say we can rotate about that joint and then um, say we have a rigid linkage here and this moves up and down. If we put a cam here, this is translating linear motion. Uh, that's actually not necessarily straight up and down. This is going into rotary motion here. As this changes this link, this angle is changing up here. See? The cam is being driven. Yeah, the cam is being driven. So let's look at another really simple way of doing this, which is let's put a, um, a rod right here. And this is free to spin. So this is my arm just falling over. And then let's put a cam right here. This is rotary motion, right? This is what I just showed you with the Legos where it's just going up and down. So I mean, it's small amounts of rotation, but I don't know what your application is. So this is just to say cams can be used for linear motion or for rotary motion, or in the case of this cam rocker, to go from almost linear motion to this weird revolute motion. OK, so that's cams. And uh, I don't think they'll work too, too well for your guys' final projects. But because, you know, well, anyway, you know why it doesn't work. It, you, you actually need more complicated motion. You're going to be controlling the motor that controls the cam anyway. It's not like you're, if you're going at a constant velocity over the chest pieces, and maybe you'd like go up and down and maybe grip or not, but um, you're not, so it doesn't work. But anyway, it's pretty cool. Okay. Let's talk about wheels. My guess is there's a large proportion of you who in your research will never use wheels, but also a large proportion of you who will at some point want to make a crazy scooter or something. Uh, scooters are one of my favorite ways to spend my time building them. Um, there are lots of wheels. I'm not going to pretend to know about all of them or to tell you about all of the ones I know about. I'm just going to go over a few sort of general things. Uh, say something obvious about this wheel. It's round. Yes. <laughs> wheels are supposed to be round. This is a good starting point. Something else. It's made out of kind of flexible Yep. It's made out of flexible rubber. I would call this a solid core uh, wheel. One of the important things about wheels is what it's made out of and basically how the springiness is set. So we've got, can everyone see this with the light on? So we've got solid core and then this could be rubber, plastic, I don't know, wood, if you're trying to do some type of Civil War re reenactment. So this is, this is sort of a, a harder rubber than this one. Um, this is a super hard plastic. And, uh, okay, so that's like probably solid core rubber is the most common and, and plastic. And this, I was just being silly. Now, the wheels on this one, if you guys can see this, I'm able to squish it. Oh man. I wish I had a cam follower for this damned uh, screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Not really, because there's no light. Uh, Niels, can you please open the windows? Can you see anything in this? It's unfortunate. Well, trust me, it's super exciting. How about now? Can you see any of the internals? What's this? 
That was a no. Damn. Do you have a flashlight? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. You all learned good. How's that? I'm not even looking at it, am I? <laughs> ah, screw it. It was a good attempt. No, it was on. No, you have to press it harder to switch it off. Damn it. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it sucks because I was going to ask you a tricky rhetorical question. But uh, can you all see this? Rob, can you zoom in, please? Everyone see this little nozzle here? Mm -hmm. Now tell me what type of wheel this is. Yeah, it's an air wheel or pneumatic wheel. This is like your bike tire that you pump up. So this is springy like the solid core rubber wheel, except I can vary um, the stiffness. Damn it. So the stiffness of that wheel is proportional, rough, more or less, to the internal pressure in the wheel. So say I have a wheel that um, uh, I want to control the amount of squishiness to get over different obstacles. Uh, maybe I'll be one day in, my robot will be in a factory. Maybe, uh, maybe another day I'll be in someone's living room. And the amount of squishiness will probably depend on what I'm trying to drive over or how much shock I want to absorb. Um, and with the pneumatics, we can, we can set that. Remember your tires and the whole try to increase your efficiency in driving by uh, increasing the pressure in your tires. So that's kind of cool. And people actually can use this um, to go over things like uh, door stops and electrical cords. So those are sort of the, uh, I mean, these are just dumb wheels. Oh, one last one. And I hope I brought it up here. Y'all can't see this, but this is neither rubber nor plastic, nor pneumatic, but it's still squishy. Anyone know what it's made out of? Foam. So solid foam. And the nice thing about solid foam is they don't deflate. But you can't really control the squishiness. So those are just standard wheels. Now, we're going to take these, yep. Um, what's the difference between stiffness and hardness? Stiffness and hardness. Uh, I'm not going into that. We'll Wikipedia it. Hardness, like Mohs hardness and all that stuff. And then surface treatment. You can have different hardness on the outside, even though it's on a squishy material. I'm not doing that. Uh, are they like at least related? Because um, mm. a lot of like, you know, rubbery things are like McMaster. Uh -huh. show you the hardness, but not like the stiffness. Yeah. They, they, uh, this is one of these overloaded uh, terminology things. Uh, what you want to do is use material science terminology. When you refer to hardness, you're referring to like Rockwell's hardness or Mohs hardness. When you refer to stiffness, then you're talking, well, is this compliance of the material? Is this a spring rate in Newtons per meter? Uh, and on McMaster, they jumble them all together. When you select something on McMaster, it's going to refer to barometer. Uh, and it might be Shore A. Um, and this is basically, they use it as squishiness, like, you know, if I, if I apply a force, how much does it squish? But normally it's not like a linear measurement. With rubbers, they get into all types of like percentage elongation, conservation of volume, all this random stuff. It's a deep rabbit hole and I haven't explored it that much, so Wikipedia. But it's really good to Wikipedia and go to materials science text. Um, what you do need to know when you're ordering the stuff on McMaster is what do you think a 50, like, say a Shore 50, A50 50 or 50A durometer means? Someone give me an example of that. The answer is who the hell knows? <laughs> Unless you do this for a living, then you don't know. And when you order silicone from SmoothOn, again, you don't know. What you do is you like Google you know, examples of Shore A50, and then, or examples of durometer in everyday life. So what McMaster does, and maybe I'll, um, let's see, rubber, 
Has anyone tried to order rubber yet from uh, McMaster? Let's see if I can. Ah. So McMaster actually will do stuff. What did we call them? There's another name for it. Bumper stops. Bumper stops. Um, nah, they don't do it either. It's okay. Ah, maybe this. It was ratings. McMaster has this nice thing for a lot of the rubber products across the bottom of the screen that gives examples. So below like 50A, it'll have a picture of a pencil eraser or a rubber band, and then for you know 10A, it'll be silly putty or whatever. So it gives you common everyday objects that you know what they feel like. So then you can be like, oh, okay, well, you know, I don't want a wheel that's like silly putty. I would like a wheel, and I think one of the examples is the sole of your shoe. So the answer is I don't I don't bother wasting my time trying to memorize A50 and A10 and all that stuff. I always look for, I either Google it or look at McMaster for, okay, I'd like a pencil eraser softness and then that's what I get. So just a practical spin. Okay, so we can take these basic wheels in terms of uh, foam and plastic, rubber, pneumatic, and we can combine them for a couple different types of wheels. Anyone know what this is? Other than scary? Yeah, right. <laughs> This actually is an Omni wheel. So there are a bunch of different wheels that basically if you have um, your car, you can't go sideways, right? So that's why we have to parallel park. But it would be nice if we had a robot that could spin in any direction or go in any velocity in the plane instantaneously. We don't have to turn if zero. A, we don't have to turn, but if we wanted to, we could do it on a dime. And so there are a whole class of different types of wheels called omnidirectional wheels. And they are awesome. Again, there are like a billion different types, so I'm not going to try to um, show you all of them because that would be silly. So let me just go ahead, before I explain too much more about it, I'll just show you this. How many of you have heard or seen of omni wheels? I'm kind of surprised it's not all of you. Can we do it again with all of you raising your hands or not? Okay. So I'm not even sure why I'm showing you this movie other than it's really cool. So we're moving diagonally. We're rotating. Going straight. In a second it's going to go sideways. Now these type of wheels, where the rollers are um, at a 45 degree angle, these are specifically called mechanum wheels. And Jonas will like this, they are Swedish invented. <laughs> so let's look at another one. So these are kind of small hobby robots, right? This is the amazing air tracks. So the US Navy bought the patent and then farmed it out to air tracks and air tracks makes uh, forklifts that are omnidirectional. <laughs> they're, they're, they're working on it. It's sketchy in terms of control. I friction. Segway also makes a base that is based on the mechanum wheels. Okay. And so you'll notice that there are different, uh, let's go back to the first one. Um, when you spin these, they produce a resultant force orthogonal to the roller, so that's at a 45 degree angle from the axis. So let's pause this for a sec. When you use them, note that there are different hand handednesses. Say that five times fast. It's kind of like with the helical gears. Yeah, so see, these are like this, and these are like this, these are like this, and these are like this. And you have to have them in that configuration for them to work. So I can't just take four of these and do one, two, three, four, because then it won't work. You actually do have to do this special arrangement. Um, so that's one type. 
Then we have another type. These are um, called interroll. And the way these work are, Rob, can you zoom in, please? Okay, right now, so basically, I provide traction in this direction, right? If I spin, because this, the roller is in this direction, but I still drag this way. See? I'm slipping, but I'm actually applying a huge amount of force to that. But then in the orthogonal direction, I roll very easily. So what this is meant for is traction in this direction and free rolling in this direction. Now what happens, so right here I'm good on the floor. What happens when I hit this, this spot? What happens? Nothing. So let, this is the noise it makes. So the solution is you get two of these. And by the way, uh, I don't know if you can tell, this is a perfectly circular um, sort of perimeter around it. You see these, these wheels are not flat. They're actually shaped. They're actually shaped like this, as if we were going all the way around a circle. So that's so that we don't have ba bump ba bump. Yep. Where what? Inter roll. So the solution is that we put two of them together out of phase. See? So now I, no matter where I am, I'm always in contact with one circular roller. Okay? So now that gets rid of the bump, 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 bump. But what does this configuration assume about the floor? It assumes it's flat. If I have a floor like this, it doesn't work. What happens if we get um, hey, this is a perfect example. You know what one of the number one killers of mobile robots in the household is? Cords. What happens if I get my cord in between this? You shift the phase. No, no, it's just going to kill your cord and it's not going to rotate. Omni wheels like this get really easily stuck on stuff. They work sometimes if you have a flat, especially compliant ground. But if they get at the wrong angle, they don't work. And if they get crap stuck in between them, they don't work. OK. Now, can I get you to unplug for a sec, please? And Rob, can you zoom in on this, please? So here are some more Omni wheels. OK. So remember, I get traction in this direction because it's orthogonal to my rollers. But then, can you see, Rob? Then you can roll freely in this direction, okay? And note that if you look dead on, this is a perfect circular profile, okay? But unlike the other two, uh, or unlike uh, these ones, they're not doing the stacks of them. It's just more rollers. Um, you still get that ba bump, ba bump, ba bump as you sort of transition from one roller to another. So that's not particularly good, but they're simple. And um, so you do the math on this, and this one can spin or translate any direction in the plane instantly, so that's really cool. So that, this is referred to as holonomic. We can control all of our degrees of freedom. I didn't build this. This was built by... This was built by a guy at the VA for... Um, uh, uh, omnidirectional wheelchair, like way back in the day. His name is escaping me, but he's a really cool guy. Um, now I can build my own Omni wheels too. Let me bring this over here. I think I showed this before, but I'll show it again just in case. So this, I wanted to drive this ball. I'm sure YouTube ball bot, and you'll come up with some cool stuff. I wanted to try my hand at it, so I worked on it for a little bit until I realized that like 20 other people had already solved the problem. So I wanted to be able to drive this ball about any axis in the plane, um, and uh, I wanted it to be holonomic. So I made these omni wheels that let this spin, and if we look underneath, See these wheels? So I just made my own laser cut 
homebrew Omni wheels. These are those skate bearings you guys have. So, you know, in this direction we have traction, right? And then in this direction we spin freely. And I oriented them through the center so that I'd never produce any uh, resultant moments. But, um, so this is directly opposite of the other one where they actually are tangent to the circle. These ones I go directly through the center of the circle. It's, it's a personal preference and how you're doing the math type thing. And the main problem with these is the bump, bump, bump. Now I never, ever, ever lose contact. But what's happening is my ball, the center of my ball is going up and down ever so slightly as I transition from being on top of one bearing to being supported by two, two bearings. So let me put the ball back on here. It actually, I, I wired it up and controlled it and it worked really well. But as I said, it wasn't novel so I couldn't publish. But, so you can see I never lose contact but watch the ball moving ever so slightly up and down. So this is an issue with every single Omni wheel I've ever seen with the exception of one. It's really cool mathematically. It was an Iker paper, I think, but it could, could hardly support any loads, so I'm not going to talk about it. So Omni wheels are awesome, and you should all order some. They're pretty cheap, depending on which they are. But every single one of these has vibration issues, as in when you're spinning them, I'm hitting some type of point where the rotation isn't good, or the rotation is good, but I'm lowering and raising your robot a little bit. So how could I get rid of that ba bump ba bump Assuming the exact same wheels. I could put shocks on my robot. There's no reason why I have to bolt you know, my robot rigidly to this. I could put some type of vibration isolator, like a, a spring damper system on here. I mean, that's what we would do on, on our cars, right? We don't have the wheels bolted directly to your seat. We have a spring damper and several of them um, in series. So if you're using Omni wheels and you don't want it to uh, you know, feel that vibration, consider isolating the vibration. Any questions about those? There's also this weird spherical thing. Um, the Romeo and Juliet that Katib has uses it, and those are really cool too. But uh, they're pretty big. I couldn't bring them over here. So, okay. So attaching, attaching. Now I know a lot of you already know about this stuff, and I'm not trying to bore you. I'm just trying to, for those of you who have missed some of the details, to fill it in. Say I want to attach a wheel to a motor. It can be a problem. So this wheel, there's just no way of doing it. They didn't provide any bolt holes. They have a central hub that we can align to, so that's cool. So you'd have to laser cut something and then do what's called pattern drilling. Do you guys know what pattern drilling is? Okay. Um, lab two. Remember how we put the laser cut pull, timing belt pulleys on the roller blade wheels? Remember how there were holes in the spokes of the roller blade wheel that we could go through? That's pretty rare. There's a reason why I bought those specific roller blade wheels for you because they have very nicely spaced, evenly spaced holes for screws. Most roller blade wheels are not like that. So that's why I picked those. Oftentimes you'll have a wheel that you like in terms of its size and I don't know, maybe it looks pretty. Uh, and it's pneumatic or something special about where you want this wheel, but it doesn't have any bolt holes. So what you do is it's called pattern drilling. So what you do is you machine or laser cut, say in this case we have a wheel and then we have three spokes, okay? No holes. And here's the central shaft. I'd like to put a hole here, here, and here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make, maybe I'll laser cut a plate or something with holes like this. And then I'll assemble it together. What do I use to align this on this before there are holes? The hub. I have a hub here. You have to have a hub. If your wheel doesn't have a hub, don't try. It's not going to work. Okay? I put this on top, and then I take a power drill, and I, I make the holes like exactly fit the drill, and then I use those holes to guide the drilling into this. Okay? This is not precise. 
But for through holes, for doing things like mounting timing belt pulleys on wheels, it's good enough. Okay? Don't do this. If this material is like steel or aluminum, please don't do this. For soft plastics and wheels and stuff, it's totally fine and very common. Um, and if you really want to do a nice job, don't do this with like a, a hand drill. You want to do this on a drill press. Okay? So you'll put the drill into the hole, and this is able to move around on the bed. And then once it's aligned, then you clamp it down. Okay? So it's called pattern drilling, and that's how you add holes to everyday objects that otherwise don't have holes. Everyone get what I'm saying on this? And should this plate be thin or thick? Why? I give you a hint. This, this should be thick if you can because you want this hole to align the drill as much as possible if you're using a hand drill. So imagine this is paper thin. It's not going to align the angle of my drill at all. I'm going to be drilling at the right point at the wrong angle. So make this as thick as you can to constrain the, the motion of the, of the drill. Sorry. Okay. Now, so you can take a wheel and you can add a pulley to drive it. Great. They also sell wheels with gears already attached or with um, uh, like the bike, the bike pulleys already attached. Those are pretty rare. I mean, they have certain sizes, but the odds are you're not going to be able to use that size. Um, this is another alternative. Anyone know what this is? Say it. You got the first word? Hub motor. So this is a wheel, and they've already embedded the motor in it, in the hub. This is called a hub motor or hub motor wheel. You can get this from goldenmotors.com or it might be goldenmotor.com. Now I hate to badmouth someone but when I bought this from goldenmotor.com and it took me like three or four weeks to actually get the guy on the phone, I ended up, he gave me his business address and ended up driving to a residence in a really nasty area of Oakland and got it from the dude's kitchen. So don't order it from goldenmotor.com but they sell them. <laughs> Huh? Yeah. Yeah. These these are really nice because the motor's already mounted on the wheel and it's super compact. All you have is plugs coming out with sensors and and motor plus and minus. Or this is actually brushless, so you have more than that. These are great. You see these a lot on electric bicycles, um, and electric scooters, and more and more you're going to see them on mobile robots. Um, they're expensive. This one with the battery and the controls is like 300 bucks. But there's literally nothing that can go wrong mechanically. All I do is I grip the shaft and then when I turn on the motor it spins and these are really high torque. Now, this is a special type of motor. This is not just a regular brushed DC motor. In this case, this is a brushless pancake or a brushless pancake motor. Um, so that brings me to the next quick topic. Does this look like a normal motor? Okay, someone tell me why not. I'll give you a hint. This is a brushed, a, 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 this is a DC motor. If I connected these to power and ground, it would spin. What's different about it? Something obvious. Geometry. Geometry. The aspect ratio of this is vastly different from your standard DC motor. So your standard DC motor has an aspect ratio like this. It's long and skinny. Pancake motors are short and fat. Now, these, if you took this apart, this would look completely different from what you were expecting. So a couple other terms for this. They're called servo disc motors or printed armature motors. Okay, so if you're looking for them, sometimes they come up as pancake, sometimes printed armature, sometimes servo disc. Now don't be confused. Uh, the term pancake or hub motor is thrown around very loosely. 
they're always referring to just this aspect ratio. But in terms of the controls, if I were to Google this, I could find both of these motors as pancake or hub motor, but this one's DC and this one's is brushless. So I can't power them in the same way. I need different control strategies. Okay, so don't be confused by the loose terminology. So I'm not going to go into all of the differences, but I just want to drive home the point that a true A true uh, printed armature motor is drastically different internally in terms of the way it's constructed. This is the copper right here. See this? That's the copper. And down here is a row of uh, eight permanent magnets. And you have an axial magnetic field. Uh, and then one last one. This is, this is another configuration. So these are very different if you dissect them. Now, in terms of why do you think people want to use these? Let's assume for the sake of argument that the number one reason for our purposes is uh, aspect ratio. There's actually some much more uh, technical reasons. They're extremely low inductance. They have zero cogging, so you can have a DC motor with zero cogging. Um, you can get them both brushed and brushless in terms of the aspect ratio. Although the true the the true pancake motor with the um, the printed armature is DC, much higher torque density. For like for a given volume of motor, you get much higher torques out of these guys. And they actually started out, anyone know where they started using these first? Uh, I mean, I could say that about everything. Um, back in the day, the tape reels for old school computers had to be spun up and down extremely quickly. And they used these for them. They're very low inductance, so the electrical dynamics are great. Um, so they used these as very compact, low inductance, uh, servoing, servo positioning of the tape reels for old school computers. So they're very good for precise applications where you need to spin something to precise position very quickly. And you're going to be decelerating and accelerating very fast. Okay, any questions? So in a regular motor you need brush to carry power, right? Yeah. And in this case you don't need brushes because you can carry power all the way? Or what the, the, these... These are just different. I'll leave it at that. Wikipedia, if you want to learn about the, the internals. I just want to let you know, it's not just another DC motor that's squished. The electrical schematic inside are completely different. If you want all those details, you should look them up. Okay, let's talk about another kind of wheel, and these are some of my favorites. Does anyone know what this is? A caster. Okay, so let me take a few of these. And come over to. Oh, hey, I forgot something. Where's my Omni wheel? Ah, oh, I have an Omni wheel. Sorry. I told you today was a hodgepodge. I've shown you this a lot, but just to show you again, this too is an Omni wheel in that I can go forward and back, and then I can turn in any direction I want and go a different direction. Okay? And if I put at least three of these on a base, then at any point, this is called a steered uh, Omni wheel in terms of, I don't just, the, the orange ones over here, at any moment, I simply switch the motors at different velocities and I go instantly in that direction. This one I can't. Say right now I decide I want to go 90 degrees, first I have to spin and then I have to go, okay? So these are a non, these on a, on a mobile base are for non-holonomic control, where you have fewer controls than you do degrees of freedom. So you actually have to um, do t uh, finite turns and sequences of the wheels to go in a different direction. These are easier to build in some respects, but um, they're non-holonomic and that's sort of a pain in the butt. Has anyone ever tried to take a power down PR2 and push it into the corner? You can thank me because 
they rip off that design and it's not holonomic. So you have to go underneath the base and spin it to the right angles and then push it. Okay, let's talk about these uh, casters. Now, Rohan is correct. These are in fact called casters. But A lot of these are made in Greece, so they're called caster choy. No? Has anyone ever seen Face Off? Okay. Eat it. Okay. This is a little joke, people. Greece doesn't manufacture anything. That's why they're going bankrupt. Sorry. <laughs> these are called ball transfers. Ball transfers, that's a more general term. If you're having trouble finding these on McMaster or something, I don't know, I haven't searched in a while, try ball transfer, and caster is basically an upside down ball transfer. So if we take our base and let's put some screw threads and then we put a spherical ball on it, this is called a ball transfer. So I've got a huge one here. If I put my hand across it, it rotates in any direction, right? Like this is a general ball transfer. And I believe, unless I'm mistaken, when you turn it upside down and put it on the floor, now it's called a caster. Okay? So, um, now caster also has different subdivisions. All casters are not ball transfers. Okay? And we'll see that in a sec. So let me just show you these cool little ball transfers I've got. Okay. So this is sort of your standard size caster, and it's very smooth. Cool. So you can see with relation to my fingers, these are everywhere on little mobile robots. Here's a plastic version. This one doesn't have a screw that comes out, instead it's threaded. This is a gigantic version from McMaster. Okay. Now let's talk about how these are constructed. Think of a ball bearing with balls. Okay. Typically, these are supported with tiny little balls, and then they've got a seal to keep them from coming out, and they've got some type of slotting system to recirculate them. So when a ball travels, if we're rotating this direction, and a ball comes from this side to this side, it's got to go somewhere. So they've got a system worked out for it recirculating. Okay? Let me show you, so that's very smooth motion, because it's ball bearing. These little guys, right here, muy pequeño. See that? This too is a ball transfer. Super ridiculously tiny. I've got three of them on here. Very low friction. Uh huh. Oh yes. These guys are 90 bucks from McMaster for one of these. 90 bucks. And I bought like 10 of them for a project. So you can play with them after, after class. They're, they're super easy to kill, but they're ridiculous. They've got little screws on them. So I wanted to show you, you can get ridiculously tiny casters, and then this is the, sort of the standard size. See that? Now you see how tiny that is? And then you can get the very big honking guy. So ball transfers come in different sizes. Now, can you all see any of the details of this? See the, what are the shiny silver things on this big black thing? These are ball bearings. This one is not supported by little balls. So the way this is, Jonas, can you hold the camera, please? I wanted to show you this one because you guys might make your own like this. I, I've been making my own ball transfers for a while, and this is how you do it. Okay. So I've got a bearing here, 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 and then deep inside in here, I've got another one oriented like this on the top. So let me draw that. Um, Rob, you're showing the board, right? Okay. So if this is my sphere, I have one bearing here, one bearing here, one bearing here, and all the way at the bottom, one bearing here. So if I try to escape through the sides, I'm rolling, and then um, there's a seal that forces the ball in, and when I load it, I'm loading it against this ball here. Everyone see how that works? You can make your own, and I encourage you to do so. It's a lot of fun. Uh huh. So if the ball starts rotating this way, is it. 
scrubbing. Yep. So if the ball starts rotating about its axis this way, it's scrubbing, right? Because all I can do is velocity in this direction, and I start, this is, this would be a line contact. No, it wouldn't. It would be a point, but that point can't move in that way. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so this would be a point contact because it's a sphere, but then I can't move this way because the, ro the, um, the bearing doesn't rotate that way, so then I'm scrubbing. So that's, I encourage you after class, come and try to do that, and you'll feel it's kind of nasty in that respect. So anyway, this is a ball transfer. Now, let me show you, okay, I think I'm good. Thanks, Jess. Let me show you a cool um, ball transfers. Typically in mobile robots, they're used for basically balancing robots. So say this is my robot, and I have a drive wheel here and a drive wheel here. Does that work? No, it's going to fall over. I'll put a ball caster right here just to um, constrain it. But they don't have to be for mobile robots like that. Let me show you this. So this is called a ball transfer table. Oh, whoa, whoa, oh, you're missing the good. So what this is, this is, uh, now these are not ball transfers, and I'll explain why in a sec. This table is able, it's got rows of wheels at 90 degree angles, and I'm able to move this package along in cool trajectories. Now let me show you another one. That was a part of the unit? No, no, no. This is, you can tell from the graininess, this was done 20 years before I was born. Okay, now why was I just talking about these ball transfers and these clearly are not ball transfers? Because oftentimes these are called ball transfer tables, that's why. Because oftentimes they'll power these so that they're not, they're not like circular wheels, they're spherical. So that's why a lot of these are called ball transfer tables. And the second I think they're going to take it into the middle and rotate it. I think these are using omni wheels actually. Each one of these is an omni wheel, I believe. It's the same concept, though, right? Instead of rotating in opposite directions, if you rotate in the same direction, then you'll actually have motion. Um, I didn't quite follow that. Come again? So, basically, in this ball transfer, mm -hmm. when you rotate that wheel, mm -hmm. um, like two of the bearings are rotating the opposite direction. But if it, if they start rotating rotating in the same direction, then your ball would linearly wobble. I I'm not quite sure I follow. Okay. Uh huh. How do you power the sphere? Uh, you ever taken apart a mouse, like an old school ball mouse? If you attach motors to those rollers, that's often how people do it. Now, like driving balls like this gets complicated in terms of um, are you scrubbing or not scrubbing? Like in in here, and I apologize. For the record, this is a point contact because it's a sphere. Um, if you try to rotate that way, it scrubs. So depending on how you configure things on, on the ball, you might scrub, you might not. You might drive a ball like here. Imagine this. This imagine the Omni ball I just showed you here could be used as a powered ball tran uh, ball transfer unit. But then I have Omni wheels, and then I have the bump, bump, bump. So ball transfer units that use spherical drives have some problems, sometimes scrubbing, sometimes vibration, sometimes they do it, off, they, often they'll get around those problems with some trickery and then you're fine. And again, the reason I'm showing you this, these are omni wheels, not ball transfers, but these are called ball transfer tables. You know where you see a lot of these in, other than factories? Airports. It's hard to see them from the tarmac, but every now and then you'll get real lucky and you'll see them, they load a lot of planes, like cargo planes with these, because they can shift them around the plane. Um, don't worry, this does not uh, obviate them from, uh, you know, just chucking your crap onto the ball transfer table. They'll still chuck your crap. But um, a friend of mine sent me a video from a, a tarmac. He was on a, on a plane and he saw them using one of these. Uh, okay, so this is, these are ball transfer casters. These are spherical. At any moment, I could be going this way, and then I decide I want to go orthogonally, no problem. What is the most common caster that you ever see? Most common, th think of daily activities, maybe on the weekends. Huh? Like your rolling chair? Oh, and cards. Like we 
Both of these. Not that, because you're, you're uh, anyway. Um, so you see these on shopping carts, and you see these on your little roly-poly office chairs. Okay? So this is your stand. When I say caster, most people think of this. So this is not a ball transfer. So I can go in this direction. Now what do I have to do if I want to go that way? I have to rotate it and go that way. Now someone tell me something obvious relating to that and this wheel. Okay, tell me something even way more obvious. Okay, actually, let me follow up on that. Based on the geometry of this wheel, if I want to go that direction, all I have to do is go that direction, right? Okay. So what about this wheel allows that to happen? Huh? No, let's try again. Think about the axes here. The first axis is right here, and that does not go through this secondary axis. The reason is because if I go this way, I produce a torque that then rotates so that I follow. If these axes are intersecting, the chances are it's not going to just to orient that way because if the force is going through the axis, I have zero torque, right? Is this like sort of overcoming a singularity or something? It's, or? Pushing, it, it's pushing at a zero moment arm. And you can push as hard as you want at a zero moment arm. And I guess, yeah, you could call it a singularity. So again, uh, if I were to um, put this axis intersecting with the vertical one, and I push and push and push, there's no lever arm, it won't rotate. You have to offset the axis so that when you push, the force here against the ground twists this and then we follow, okay? Now, say I wanted, at this point it's just a bunch of random like Ruben knowledge stuff, I apologize. Say I wanted to build a high velocity vehicle with two drive wheels and one or two of these. Good idea. Why, why not? If you're really nice, I'll show you something fun. There's no control. Um, they, they follow, so you're good. They just follow any direction. What? Do you want to use ball casters over these wheels? Maybe. You tell me why. Because if you're going at speed so fast, sometimes that wheel is Thank you. Okay. So there are a couple issues here. If Okay. Let's let's write them down. So we have shock absorption. We have vibration. These are two big issues with casters, especially at high velocities. So this caster is pneumatic. So it helps absorb a lot of the impacts. I, I take my bike pump and I pump this up and it takes a lot of the impact from the road and this is good, right? So we get past the shock absorption problem. If I were to use this as a ball caster on my vehicle, this is super hard plastic. This isn't going to absorb anything. So all of the shocks go directly to me. So that's bad. The two are opposite. However, at high velocities, this tends to do this. I'm sure everyone has been in a shopping cart and their damn thing keeps doing this. And that's, that's low velocity. So you can imagine putting this on a scooter would be terrible. Okay? Does this do that? No. So we have two casters we could use for high velocities. This one has a much lesser... Uh, oh, much higher shock absorption than this one because this is pneumatic. Can you make a pneumatic ball one like this easily? Oh, let me rephrase. Can you buy a ball transfer that's pneumatic? No. You can make one like I did. That's why I made it. By the way, the reason I did that, you'll notice this is a pneumatic ball. This is pneumatic. You can squish it quite easily. Okay. So this absorbs a lot of shock, but um, you don't buy it, you have to make it. Or, I can get this to, to take the vibration, but, uh, but then it's good I have shock absorption because I'm vibrating constantly. It's just a real quick little fun thing. 
like my second week in California after undergrad, I um, made a motorized lazy boy. And the way it worked was I had two drive wheels. And then I had two casters in the back. In the back. In the back. Following. If you put casters in the front. Hey, another hint, guys. These are followers. This is outside Clark. They, they started to hate me in only two weeks. Oh, no, I had to throw it out. There were no brakes. I hate brakes. Okay. Sometime when I've graduated, I'll uh, show you what I did with the hub motor. If anyone knows, don't answer. We're on tape. Okay. Would this be, these follow, right? I move forward and it swings to the direction I want. My option is, if I'm moving, if my base is moving this direction and these are powered and these are casters, and this is the front and this is the back, do I want my casters in the front, back, why or why not? They have to be in the back so they can follow. If you put these type of casters in the front, it's going to be hell. I mean, you can do it, but it's just not going to work real well. Okay. Cool. Alright, I promised you some special motors a while back and I'm not going to renege. More of the hodgepodge. So remember a while back I told you about ultrasonic motors? So let me give you the skinny and ultrasonic motors. They suck in terms of controlling. If you buy a really nice ultrasonic motor from a company, at least back in the day, controlling that was really annoying. Now I'm sure they've gotten better and I'll probably receive an angry email if anyone actually ever watches this. Um, but usually, controlling them is very hard. Um, buying them is even harder because typically you buy them from a Japanese website in Japanese. However, there's a new company, newish, called PCBMotors.com that you should all go to. And if I had budget in the course, I would have bought everyone one. PCBMotors.com. So it not only is it an ultrasonic motor, it is directly printed onto a PCB. See that spinning? So this is just a raw PCB. Now I could take this apart without, without damaging it. All it is on this guy it is the stator and it has these ultrasonic piezoelectric transducers that vibrate the thing. This thing that's spinning is called the, um, the rotor because it's rotating and that's connected to the shaft. Now let me turn this off for a sec. There's no S in the website. There's no what? S. Oh, there's no S in the website. Thank you. PCBMotorSingular.com. What's this silver thing in the middle? From lab one. Is it Nope. What's it doing? Why would I want something silver there? This is a friction drive, okay? The piezoelectric transducers have to be held with force against this rotor for it to rotate. What does the silver thing do? It's a spring washer. It's not a Belleville washer. It's a special type of spring washer. The silver thing preloads this friction drive. So real quick, let me switch back to the laptop to show you how this works. Um, Okay, so the first guy, here we go. So this is an, a finite element simulation of how these guys work. So what you're doing is each one of these little guys 
is an ultrasonic transducer that induces a vibration. And then there is a sinusoidal there's a sinusoidal wave that travels around the macrostructure. And this is basically a, a contact point with the rotor that is moving around. Okay? So every high is in contact with the rotor and that high point of contact is rotating around sinusoidally and that's what moves it. Damn you, YouTube. This is what... Um, let's watch it one last time because it's kind of short. See, my point of contact is rotating the rotor around. See that? You don't build these yourself. You buy them because this is some pretty special physics. Now let's look at a couple of these cool uh, ones. Here is one of the advantages of PCB motors is that they make hollow shaft versions. Check this out. Can you do that with a normal DC motor? Like just the motor? Like have a hollow shaft that's like yay big? No. This is freaking amazing. Uh, you could bolt to it. You could glue to it. They leave it up to you to attach things to it. And that you just gave me a perfect segue. Yes? Uh, yeah, you have to put, this is, uh, you have to put an encoder on it. Yes. There's, I don't remember the paper reference. There's a Jap, I think it might be the Yamano hand or something. There's a Japanese hand that's got like, I don't know, over 15 degrees, I think like 20 degrees of freedom or something, and every joint is actuated with a little ultrasonic motor, and they, but they've got encoders. Now, I didn't show you any because I really hate them. They're called, um, they got a bunch of different names. They're basically hollow DC motors. You take a Maxon motor, and you drill all the way through the shaft, and it's hollow, and then you make it big. So it's like, I don't know, 20 millimeter internal diameter through the shaft. So, um, Almost no one uses them. Mainly it's military people. They're super hard to use, super hard to buy. So I didn't tell you about them. But this is like a, t you know, a, a fraction of the cost. Um, now let me show you something else really exciting. I think it's $500 or $700 to get started with a starter kit. But you gotta keep in mind these things take special like drives. You don't plug them into power and ground. They they need a special controller. So I think it's like 700 bucks to get like a couple motors and a controller as a sample pack. And then, but each each motor once you have the controller is really cheap, like 50 bucks. Yep. Thank you. What's this? <laughs> Anything you want is the answer, literally. Dude, how crazy is this? He just put a coffee cup on an ultrasonic transducer and made it rotate. That's amazing. So the answer is, um, these things are really good for any time you need a hollow sh a shaft. Uh, they're really good for any time you need a really thin motor. I mean, these guys are, let, let me go back to... Um, let me go back here and show you how thin it is. It's an aspect ratio thing. Okay, so look how thin this is. Very thin, good aspect ratio. This is friction drive. So say I attach it to a load and the load goes crazy. It just slips harmlessly, it doesn't break anything. So I can back drive them, but not in the sense of the gear ratio is such I can overcome the inertia, I can simply backdrive by breaking the friction safely. So one of the places these are starting to make an appearance, you know the audio mixer boards? Where you have like a billion little knobs that control the levels for making uh, music albums? Often they have buttons you press and, and all of the, the knobs configure. In fact, let me see if I can find it. Um, Um, it depends on the preload and the, the size. So I can't verify what's going to be on the screen in just a sec. So, okay. So this is a standard audio board with all these EDB little knobs. Now, typically, what they'll have is sometimes 
you want, so you're going to be, uh, give me a little bit more cowbell, give me a little less vocals. Uh, and so you're going to twist these knobs to where you want them to be. Okay? But say you only have one board for a studio, but a bunch of different artists, so you'll have different presets. So when Cowboy Boy comes back in, you press a button and it all, all of the knobs move back to the previous settings. And then you can you know, record Yo Yo Ma instead, and uh, it'll go to the settings for him. So they have to be powered but you also have to be able to backdrive them. So there's at least one audio board now is using the PCB motors because um, they drive them, but then you can break through their friction and backdrive them later. And the reason why they're so good for this, look how densely populated these guys are. Could you, would you want to put, or could you put that many Macton motors so close together? No. So what you do, because you can print these directly to a PCB, is you make a PCB in this size and shape, and each knob you simply print on there the motor. You print the motor on. That's what's so incredible. So in terms of making l very high density, highly packed number of actuators, you really can't beat doing the PCB motor style. And so the, they'll sell you just the transducers. So what you do is you make your PCB, they sell you the transducers, you solder them on, and you're done. I'm not sure. I, I think I saw them down to 20 millimeters, and they get pretty big, up to like 80 millimeters or something. Yep. And what are the like load limitations? Not sure. That pretty I'm not sure. Small. Um, I think so. They're not meant for moving huge torques. Yeah. They're mainly for for precisely positioning things compactly. So like optical mirrors or audio sliders, but not huge things. Okay. Um, almost done, and then we'll get to the sample code. Are there questions thus far? <coughs> okay, so this is sort of a... Uh, I may be insulting you all with this. If, if so, I'll stop talking about it. I don't know how much you know about what you know and if you've ever actually dissected it. How does your i uh, oh hey they don't that's the answer I was gonna say how do your I iPhones vibrate do iPhones vibrate yeah, yeah. they do okay cool um, how do they vibrate unbalanced an unbalanced load how many people here have actually seen a a pager motor not that many good okay I'm not insulting you. so these are called vibrator motors. They're very tiny. This is one size. Actually, let me get you another size. You can get them big, you can get them small. Um, and the way they work is it's just a velocity. See those? See how little they are? And if we look down at them, see it's a hemisphere of material. So basically, this is called an eccentric load. So let me draw it on the board for you. So if I were to take this mass and spin it, then uh, it's not balanced. So um, I'm going to have forces moving all the way around. And um, so these are called vibrator or pager from, does anyone actually have a pager back in the day? Someone had parents who were doctors who had pagers. Um, eccentric mass motors, any three of these terms. So it's eccentric because the center of mass is somewhere out here. It's not co-located with the axis of rotation. Okay? Um, and you can buy those and then put them in your little robots. What is a really cool research reason I might want to get vibrator motors? Oh. Haptics. You can use them for giving people vibration on different parts of the body, different levels for ha or touch feedback. How about some HCI guys? So a friend of mine worked on a project where, um, and there are lots of permutations of this, somebody wants to follow Google Maps without looking at their iPhone. So 
you tell Google Maps to uh, vibrate left, right, forward, back, and then I don't have to look at it, I can see where my feet are, and then it vibrates me right and I walk right, and it vibrates me left and I walk left. Also for blind people, who can't, literally can't look at the iPhone. Uh, okay, so that's it for today's topics. Are there any questions about today's topics? I recognize this is a hodgepodge of weird uh, topics, but... Nope. Okay. Let's go over the sample code. Jonas, can I get you to man... Actually, um, Rob, can you please zoom in on the board and then come man the camera, please? You're all free to go at, the, oh, at this point, but some of you should be wise and stick around. Seven to ten. Shit. Now until eight. And then... Okay. Can you zoom in on these? Actually, first, come get my laptop. Stand behind me. No? All right. So I didn't give you starter code for everything, mainly because I didn't have time. I gave you starter code for the servos board and for the DC motor board because they were the hardest. Take the code I've written, and if you want, copy it and modify it for the stepper board and for any other board you want. Now, in terms of structure, this is C++, object-oriented, classes and all that good stuff. I made it so that you can use my starter code either with a GUI or without. So for each motor, take the DC motor. There's something called, there's a class called, we're still recording, right? No, isn't there? Okay. There's a class called Fidget DC Motor. So that is the actual motor controls with all the fidget code. And then if you wanted to take it out of the GUI, that's what you'd take. Then there's a class called My DC Motor that has all the GUI stuff and then makes calls to my fidget motor. Okay? So you can either use my GUI or your GUI or you can use my starter code without any GUI and just call the C functions. Um, the DC motor, I gave you either velocity control or position control with the encoder. I just gave you a PID. I set the I to zero, so right now it's PD. Feel free to do whatever control all you want. Don't argue with me about the gains. I just put them somewhere where it didn't go crazy and unstable. Uh huh. It's the usual password. Don't say it out loud for anyone random watching. <laughs> Otherwise, the Chinese will take us all over with fidgets. <laughs> um, now, installing this stuff is pretty easy. First, you install Qt. Okay? That's all you need to do. Qt with Qt Creator. Then, in the folder, there'll be something called GUI Motors.pro. No, that's huge. It's like 1.7 gigs. Download it from qt.com. Yeah, there are two things. One's called QT, the other's called QWT. Jonas took care of QWT for us, don't worry about it. All you download is QT. Go to qt.com, downloads. Uh, you want the Windows version if you're on Windows. And you want, it's like, do, do the online installer. It's like 1.7 gigs. Install Qt, okay? Then go into my folder, right click GUI motors.pro. It will pull up the following. And that zoomed in on the screen? Okay. It's not Qt.com. Qt something. Qt no kill. Uh, just Google Qt. There's only one Qt. Okay, this is what it's going to look like. We'll have a GUI motors program. We'll have QWT and we'll have CS235 app. The first thing you have to do, right click QWT and hit build. Okay? This basically takes the QWT source code and makes the libraries on the fly in our folder. If instead of that, 
you try to right click GUI motors and do build, it will fail because QWT is not built yet. If you right click CS235 app and run build before you do so for QWT, it will fail. The order of operations is QWT right click, build, then and only then CS235 app build. Okay? Now, at that point in QT Creator, this little play button, the green play button, that runs the program. I'll give you a hint. If you were to just hit the play button, the odds are 50-50 it will not do anything because it doesn't know if you're talking about running QWT or running the CS235 app. So to run it, you want to right click CS235 app and hit run. Okay, how much of this is on the screen? So this is the GUI I've given you. All the source code is in here. It's not commented. Now, um, this button ends the program. Okay? Don't exit out of GUIs without having a button. Always do that. See, I just hit the play button. It didn't work. I just forgot my own advice. Okay. So, this is the stepper. See the little curve? So this is a time history of what's happening. Okay? See the blue and the red? Those are actual position and goal position. I'm telling it, hey, go to 100. And it's trying, but there's a lag. So, and I don't remember which is which. I think red right now is actual. See how the blue has trouble following up? Now another thing, if you press this little auto button, it will auto zoom to the min and max of the real data. See? Say you have your servo at a place that you really like and you don't want it to move anymore and you don't want to forget and press the slider. Press the enable button. Uh, actually, I changed it. All right, let me give you a different example because that was at 3 and I finished at 3.30. Say you have a servo motor controlling something and you want to move it and back drive it, but it's not letting you because the servo is holding the position. If you press the enable button, it lets go and then the motor is back drivable. Um, so anytime you need to back drive a servo, don't try it unless you first uncheck the enable button. I've given you four motors. If you change one number or one set of numbers, it will go up to eight. This board can handle eight. Let me just show you real quick in the source code mainwindow.cpp this is where I make my servo and my DC motor. This is the only code that makes the servo. Okay? Basically, I'm passing in servo start angle. It's a vector of start angles for where I want the servos to start. Right now, I have a vector and I've pushed back four values. What does that mean for the number of servos? Four servos. If I were to comment out this and only give three servos, it's compiling. Hopefully it won't crash. It'd be real embarrassing. Now it's only running three servos. And then if I push back, I can push back up to eight. If you push back past eight, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put any limits, so I'll probably just crack up. Okay, let's look at the DC motor. This is the position slider. And it may not be plugged in or something. Oh, yeah. Oops. Okay. Now, this is really poorly attuned, right? Red is, uh, or red is commanded, blue is actual. Okay? Now, this is position control. You'll notice, and I put the CPR in here. I don't know if it's correct or not, so check it. Um, I can't slide the velocity because right now I'm in position control. See this little enable button? Click that and now I'm not in position control and I can't drag position, I'm in velocity control. So now I'm just spinning at a constant velocity. This is for debugging purposes. Now let me do a different velocity. All you need to do to switch back to position control is uncheck that button 
and now I'm at position control, okay? So let me let it auto scale for a sec. All right. Now, when you're making your control loop, I have a different motor from the motor you guys have, which means the gains are going to be different. Also, the stiffness of your mechanism are going to require different gains. I've given you sliders for the gains. This is P, D, and this is the I. A word of caution, I will blow up. Not me personally. I is in the integrator. Watch, watch this. I just made I freak out. I is way too high. Someone tell me what's going on, because this is awesome. Wind up. Um, wind up resulting in what? Limit cycling. I'm going back and forth. What's happening is I have wind up, which is railing at 100% duty cycle. I'm saturating the motor. I need more control effort than I have. Saturating an actuator leads to limit cycling. That is the characteristic. If you look at your output volt, now it's just freaking out. All right. See how it's cycling back and forth? I should have talked about this another time, but whatever. This is an old 206 thing before 206 died. Um, you can't drive your motors at 100% all the time from a control perspective because when you saturate your actuators, you start limit cycling. So if you're always at 100% duty cycle, you need to adjust something so you're not because then it's going to do this. And a quick, a, a, uh, one of the ways that you quickly saturate your motors is by screwing with the integrator and making it too high because it winds up, the air accumulates. If you want to do integration, do you know why you'd want to do integration? Exactly. We could do integration to get rid of steady state error. I'm going to play it again now that it's not spazzing. Oh, that didn't work. Do you want to know a trick for not forgetting about the play button? Close out. Go to the folder. Oh man, where's the folder? Ah, go into CS235 app. Right click CS235 app.pro and open that in Qt Creator. You only need to open the GUI motors.pro the first time when you build QWT. Every time after that, just go straight to the CS235 app.pro and it will only open that. And now I can just uh, press the play button and I'll be fine. Okay, see? Now, um, see how they are not matching? That is called steady state error. The only way to get rid of that is integration, even mathematically. But if you add integration, be careful because it may go unstable and saturate and limit cycle and it would be a whole thing. This is the slider for gain in terms of proportional gain. This is the slider for velocity gain. A hint. Uh, I haven't looked exactly at how they're doing it, but it appears to me the fidget velocity estimates are terrible. Be careful with them. I doubt that it's real velocity that they're measuring. I don't know what they're doing, but I know it's not working from my experience the way that typically adding on a derivative term should. How's the position? Position's pretty good. Backward difference. What it's doing is uh, you're sending, when you're sending a velocity, you're actually sending a voltage. I even named at one point voltage instead of velocity. Think about it in terms of, you know how there's current drive and voltage drive? Fidgets are voltage drive. The reason they're calling it current is in steady state. Sorry, the reason they're calling it velocity is in steady state, voltage drive leads to velocity drive, okay? Don't think about it that way. Think about voltage. You're setting voltage from minus 100 to 100. You know what that is? It's clockwise or counterclockwise, 0 to 100% duty cycle. Okay? Um, if you want to make a better uh, velocity estimate, you need a timer. And then you subtract your current distance from your last distance, divided by the time between the loop calls, filter it with a first order filter. We can talk about that another time. And you've got a nice, clean velocity signal. What you don't have is an OS, i.e. Windows, that can give you a reliable time estimate. So you're kind of screwed in terms of derivative terms, but if you really want to do it and you're not happy with fidgets, talk to me later and we can figure it out. Okay, say something is unhappy. Let's, let me turn up I. 
Okay, your motor's freaking out. Your mechanism's gonna die. Press the enable button, and it kills signals. Now, when you repress the enable button, it's gonna start freaking out again. This gives you a little stop, all right? Say you uh, want to home your DC motor by setting the encoder to zero. See this not homed button? Press it, and you go home. Uh, let me turn down integrator. It's probably going to keep freaking out for a while. Um, let me run it again. Okay, so I'm going to put it here. Is that at zero right now? No. Boom. Yeah. Boom. Boom. It keeps setting it down to zero. That's pretty much it. So, uh, this slider is just a little, I gave it to you to tweak random variables as a test. Yeah? Now yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah? I don't know what she just said, but it sounds pretty smart. <laughs> um, let me give you the overall layout. This is super important. Main.cpp controls the um, the fast robot thread. In a GUI, you have two threads. You have the graphics GUI thread, and you have all the other robot threads. I've given you exactly one GUI thread and one robot thread. The GUI thread is um, this return app exec. The GUI thread is controlled by mainwindow.cpp. If you want to affect the GUI thread, you edit mainwindow.cpp. Okay? This is where I made my in button. This is where I made my DC motor. This is where I made my servo. Oh God, something happened. Um, so GUI thread is main window.cpp. Main.cpp, uh, don't screw with the stuff in int main unless you really need to. This right here, my class, my thread robot thread, that is your robot thread. Do your PID calls from the robot thread. Update your servos from the robot thread, okay? You never want to try to do real-time-ish stuff in a GUI thread, okay? So you'll notice here, and these are parallel threads. The GUI's updating while my robot is doing things. Right here, I have a while my start end program flag is one. So basically, as long as my flag is high, I'm gonna keep my robot. When I press the in button in the GUI, it sets the flag low and my robot, GUI, uh, my robot thread terminates. And each loop, all I do is I say, move my DC motor. And then move my servo motors. So say you wanted to add a stepper. You add the stepper in the main GUI window, and then you give it commands in the robot thread from main.cpp. The way I've structured it is everything belongs to the GUI. Everything. Motors, variables, it all belongs to the GUI because it's easier that way. Then main.cpp only needs one pointer and it can access all variables. So if you're wondering, hey, how do I read the encoder on my DC motor? It's in the GUI thread. So the way this works is GUI window is the pointer to the GUI. So if I want to access my DC motor from the robot thread, first I do GUI window and it's C++, so then arrow, DC motor zero is my DC motor object, and then this is a function to move my motor. Okay? And it will autocomplete in QT. So let's take a look at this real quick. Say I wish to get my, um, this is my GUI, okay? If you, if you want to access any information from the robot thread, start with a GUI. GUI, autocomplete. I've got a DC motor. I've got a servo board. Cool. So let's say I want to take a servo. Um, actually, let's do DC motor. Okay. And then look up in the class to see what things are called. 
And then I think it's called My DC Fidget Motor. Cool. What about My DC Motor? Um, I wanted to differentiate. My DC Fidget Motor has nothing to do with a GUI. DC Motor Zero is a GUI that incorporates the non-GUI element. This is so you can separate it out. And then let's say read encoder. Okay, so that's how I would read an encoder from my DC motor, from the robot thread outside of the GUI. Let me show you in this class. This is my DC motor. So I've got an enable button, velocity control, home button. I've got a plot. I've got these sliders. Those of you who have hacked for years by copying and pasting will love this starter code. All you do is you copy and you paste. If something breaks, copy less. Paste less. Line by line if necessary. Okay? Um, if it seems like there's something there, that, like an initialization, and you don't understand why it's there, trust me. It's there because it broke until 3.30 last night when I added it. So be careful when you're cutting and pasting. Be judicious. Just to show you real quick, you know those real-time plots that show the variables? This is how we make them. This variable right here, it's a new data plot, and then this vector, plot data vec, that is a vector of double pointers. This is what makes that vector. I make a vector and I push back the memory address of a variable. If I have a double called test, this would be ampersand test. The other way you can do it uh, down here is you can pass it a blank. Say you know you want two variables. Pass it vector double star two comma null. It's just a vector of length two with nothing written there for the addresses. And then down here, I can update it. Go into plot. The vector that you're going to be updating is called data vector. And then set manually that. So there are two ways to do it. You can either pass in a blank at first for the constructor and then update it later. Or you can pass in something real in the constructor. So your, your uh, server thread is, is updating the memory. Right, and then calling a refresh on the GUI? No. Uh, what's happening is the GUI in mainwindow.cpp, right here at the end of the constructor, GUI timer ID start timer 33, that means my GUI updates every 33 milliseconds, okay? This main window timer event, every 33 milliseconds, this fires. So then I give my DC motor timer update event, server board timer update event. And then in there, basically I pass through my various classes, hey, there's a timer, do something. And then it updates all of the plots and everything. You don't have to worry about updating the GUI at all from the robot thread. The GUI will continue to plot things and the world will spin regardless of what the robot thread is doing. However, if you do make another class, such as a stepper class, A, you have to tell, um, keep a parallel structure to what I'm doing, you want to tell uh, in main window.h, you want to tell, hey, I'm going to have my stepper, and it's a pointer to it. Then in main window, you're going to make it with a constructor. Then in here, timer event, you have to tell it stepper board timer update. And then here in program, we're going to be closing. Oh, that says not working. That's embarrassing. <laughs> Let's see if it works now. As I told you, it's been a long week. I took research code that had nothing to do with this and hacked it and QWT updated to a new version so none of my old functions worked. So I spent the day like redoing all the damn functions for a new QWT and then I wrote the fidget. Let's try. Hey, it worked! Okay, so when you come across that server board close and it says not working, it does work. So screw that. And I'm awesome for making it work, by the way. Um... Rob, can you uh, post on... Uh, Rob's going to show you something cool real quick. This. Okay, see this little guy? Right now, it's enabled. Uh, that's my arm. It's fascinating. Okay, I can't back drive. I press the enable button and I can back drive. Then I press the enable button again and it goes back. That's cool. 
Any other questions? And yeah, I know you're going to have like a billion of them and most of them I can't answer. I refer you to someone who's CS. Uh, any questions? We're good on that. I will continue to work on this. I will make things, if there are things I think you can copy, I will not work on them. I probably won't give you a stepper class because literally take my, um, take my servo class and copy it and make that a stepper class. You all can do that, I'm confident. Some of the graphing things in GUI, like how to graph the kinematics of a robot, I probably will continue to work on because that may be a little less obvious in terms of you have to dig into QT instead of copying code. So I'll probably keep working on that. So this is version one. If you find things that are broken or don't work, please email me or put it on Piazza. Um, I'll try to comment the code at some point, but you know, that's probably not going to happen. So. How do you build it again, like initially? Go, are you, do you have GUI Motor Pro? I had that. But then uh, oh. I tried building QWT out of there. Yep. But. Yeah. <laughs> Go to. Uh, so, like here, right? Right click QWT. This? Yeah. Build. Oh, God. The build, yeah, the build work needs to be at the same level. Yeah, thank you. I don't know why there are two of these. Can you close out? Sure. Close, it? close out the whole thing. And then go. Can I like double click on this and open it? No. Or no? That file right there, dot pro. Yeah. Right click. Actually, um, open with. You don't have Qt installed yet, do you? That's dot user. That's a dot user file. Is it? I can open yeah. QT. The extension on it is dot pro dot user. Uh, Even though they don't show all of the extensions. Uh, it's actually dot, the first one is dot pro. Okay. Hey, everybody. David Cummings is awesome. That's a given. The second thing is um, if you are hiding extensions in Windows, you may have two files that look like a dot pro file. Unhide the extensions. One of them will be dot pro. The other will be dot pro dot user. Don't use the dot user. Open the dot pro. If it asks you, it looks like you have user settings saved, would you like to import it? Say no, because if you do say yes, then it'll try to do something screwy with my computer settings, okay?